Hey everybody, welcome to Trading Futures with me, Anthony Crudelli. On today's show, I'll be speaking with futures traders Damon Pavlados and Matt Paxkenna, intuitive energy worker and feng shui consultant at Redbird Reiki, Sarah Gaines, trader and performance coach Dan Hodgman, and last but not least, futures trader Danny Sitlow. Welcome to Trading Futures. What year did you begin trading on the floor? What year did you start on the floor? So I'm going to show my age, huh? We're going to have to, uh, yeah. right, I guess. 1977. 1977. Yes. So. so talk to us about what you did while you were on the trading floor. Uh, you know, I'm going to keep it short because 42 years, there's quite a bit of history, right? So in 1977, I started in the cattle pit. 79, I decided to buy a seat at the Mid-America Exchange. It just got under my skin. I wanted to do something. Uh, and start trading, and that's where I started trading. From that point, I came back after a little bit. I traded, I did okay, but it was too early, and I came back, started working on the CME floor, ended up uh, soon after that, 1981, 82-ish, working for uh, uh, Sherston American Express, started the S&P operation, which was crazy, as you know, from the day one. Worked there for four or five years where I worked with Paul Tudor Jones and executed for a lot of big funds, uh, Blue Spacon, things like that. Went on my own, uh, rented a seat, leased a seat. From then on, I, I traded from then on with a CME seat, and I had all three of them in my uh, career. By 1999, when things were going electronic, I decided to uh, get out in front of it. I, I had my own company at that point, execution company. There's about 45 of us and uh, things were going electronic, so we built this electronic trading platform to get out in front of it. You know, I remember looking in the pit one day, and everybody's looking at the e-minis, and uh, you know, the the bids and offers were based on if the e-minis went off. And, and as you know, we were both in the pit. That was the end. You yep. know, when, when the S and P's weren't making the price from the pit, it was from the uh, e-minis that took over the volume. And, and when that happened. We decided to do something, and we created this trading platform, uh, trading platform for FuturePath, Photon Trader. And soon after that, about 2001, I left the floor. We still had the operations to do this, and uh, you know, we we uh, still have the platform today. FuturePath Trading is really an online trading uh, brokerage, and uh, I still trade. And as you know, Linda Rashke is my wife. You know. And, uh, but I've been doing charts since 1979. In fact, in 1979, I started a charting service too. I was doing charts by, by hand on, on regular paper, right? And just to let you know how far we've gone, the Mid-America Exchange put the quotes on a chalkboard. So when they busted a trade, they erased it. <laughs> you know, it's just like crazy. You're like, wait a second. That's how far we went from that to lit screens. That was a big deal. Uh, and then, of course, electronic trading really took over. And you c- it was so much more transparent and different that it was really hard for a lot of traders to make that transition. No, yeah, it was. Yeah. And two years that I could really relate to that you mentioned, 1977, that's the year I was born. No, no. <laughs> and 1999 is when I became a member of CME and when I started to trade electronically. So I was only in the pit, I mean, obviously as a clerk and all that for, for many years, but I was only in the pit for about six months. I wasn't a really good pick trader, but yeah. I moved to the screen right away. I saw the writing on the wall early, just mm-hmm. as you did. So for me, the transition was a little bit easier because I wasn't good at the pit, so yeah. moving to the screen was Much my better. best option. Uh, how did you make that transition from all that experience that you talked about working on the floor to them becoming a successful electronic trader. Mm-hmm. So we had this execution operation, and I executed for big firms, right? But I always did charts. I, so that was something I did ahead of time. I, you know, I didn't, uh, you know, I, so I had my charts, and I had my buy signals and sell signals. The difference is I didn't press a button. I would go, hey, you know, sell me 10 contracts at the market, you know, or whatever. I, that's how I put my orders in. Um, but some of the things on the floor could be taken to the uh, screen, and Photon Trader was kind of designed 
primarily from me and my partners who were from the floor. And I tried to take some of the volume flow that I had on the floor and put it on the screen because that was a huge advantage. And as you know, in the pit, the volume is what drove and confirmed breakouts. If you're making a new high and there's no volume, and it was and, noisy. And, 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 and I can hear myself bidding. You knew you were in trouble, right? Because <laughs> exactly. I'm not going to drive it to new highs. But if, yeah. if Goldman's buying and uh, Merrill Lynch is buying, there's confirmation there. And usually they're not just going to stop there. They're going to have a buy yeah. program that can continue for a half an hour. So those trend days are what really hurt the guys on the floor more than anything because they, they like to sell highs and buy lows, right? You know, and buy wholesale, sell retail. So, uh, I took that to the, off the floor, and once we got electronic volume on the screen, it was way better than it was for the traders off the floor because they didn't see anything. We saw the volume in the pit, right? Now on the screen, in milliseconds, you're seeing the volume. And, it's, and so that's part of my strategy. I took a lot of that and threw that into my trading strategy because uh, in milliseconds, you're seeing real volume, uh, you know, and it's a real... Uh, real-time indicator, you know, it's, it's not lagging like a lot of other, other indicators. So you could see what's happening at that millisecond. So that was, that's part of my strategy, you know, and I incorporate, incorporated that into the charts. And then one other thing, too, um, leaving the floor and, you know, going on the screen, you know, the, the overnight markets weren't that important, you know, when it came out low volume, they didn't drive, uh, you know, they pretty much opened up, had five, six tick ranges, but when the E-minis e came, it started expanding, get crazy. 2008 changed everything, because, you know, we were so connected, you know, the banks, you know, Citibank has a, sneezes, Europe has a problem, because they're everywhere, all these banking, uh, banks were connected, so the overnight markets were important, and so now I break them out to really watch to see how they handle uh, each time zone. So that, that's another strategy that I feel was something to pick up. But going from the floor to the screen, I realized that the advantage you had on the floor, the only way you could get that on the screen is by seeing the volume because we could see the volume in a pit. I could see who's buying and who's yep. selling, you know. Um, and so, but it's a much flatter uh, uh, advantage or landscape and for everybody everybody else can take advantage of that so you got to be on top of it because as you know there's tons of indicators and systems and all that stuff so taking a, a little bit back to the basics helped me too because you, you get into this thing where you overanalyze the markets well and, uh, we could talk all day yeah. all day about this stuff yeah. but how about we go to the charts take a look at your strategy sure. and we'll go from there sounds good all right all right, everybody, next up, Damon and I will go to the charts and we'll take a look at his strategy. Stay tuned. This is my headquarters. This is where I trade and manage my portfolio. Since I added futures, I have access to the oil markets and gold markets. Okay. I'm plugged into equities, trade confirmed. And I have global access 24 seven, meaning I can do what I need to do. Then I can focus on what I want to do. Visit your online broker today to learn more. Welcome back, everybody. Damon and I are now at the charts. Damon, love that intro, man. That was great. <laughs> All right, now I pulled up on TradeStation a daily E mini SP and a daily Russell charts, and we put some indicators on here and some things you wanted circled. Talk to sure. us about what we're seeing here. So this is a, a basic setup that I like to use. Um, these are dailies. I use a 30 high moving average, a 30 low, a 10 close, and a 5 close. So this is just a basic with a, a stochastic. I wanted to give you something that's easy that everybody can kind of use, and it, it helps me. So when the slope is turning down and you go below the 30 low moving average, you would get a sell. Stop goes above the 30 high. When the 5 crosses the 10, you you either cover it or if you have other levels, of course, which, you know, th those will also supersede anything like this. Like if I have a level here, you'd get out. So you get a buy here. This was a sell. If you were just to do it like this, that's, you know, pretty much how that works. You, you, normally, the, the a high and low band, you buy it above it, you sell it below it kind of thing. But I threw the tenant for the slope. When the slope turns up, 
that's telling me to get out. So in other words, like when this went up and we crossed right here, I would have got out way before here. So, you, you know, th that's kind of how that works. And you could, uh, you could see this on all four. I use all four of these charts the, uh, for the indexes for confirmation, yeah. and they all work together. So I wait for all of them to be in a buy, at least three out of four, if I'm going to go ahead with it. Like if I'm trading the ES and I got to buy an ES, I got to have two more indexes that have a buy. At four is ideal, but you know sometimes you don't always get four; you get a lagger. But this is a basic setup here, and then of course I use basic uh, trend lines. Like this happens to be uh, you know a breakout. This is a daily. We made new highs, contract highs right there. You know? Yeah, so I moved I, it to the Nasdaq and the, and the sure. Dow for everybody. And then these right. are the four markets that you're looking at for yeah. trading the ES. That's correct. And what I really love about this is this can help you intraday, correct me if I'm wrong, with determining your bias on the bigger picture. True. Right? Sure. And then also this could be a swing trade po possibility for you as well. Correct. Correct. Now, you know, I definitely look at this, the basic charts, just to get an over view but okay. you know when you're trading a five and a 30 minute it's good to know the direction of the trend you want to trade in the direction of the trend so that's why I look at this you know if we if we're in a bull market here bull trend or bull signal on the day charts I'm buying dips most of the time you know that's yep. you know my strategy so this is your initial homework every day yeah and this is the uh, the start of it start. and you'll see on the next charts too uh, a little bit more now all right, now here's some of your intraday stuff. We mm -hmm. have your photon trader here. Talk to us about what we're seeing. Okay, so we talked about volume, how it confirms. So we created these volume candles, kind of like equal volume candles, but these are a little better. There, there's an algorithm built in. So the, th this is a five minute, for instance. And you could say, when we get a breakout and you trade in the direction of the trend, these little dots here, are I call them PAV reversals. They're my own reversal, uh, you know, like a two, two bar reversal basically. And so we can't get into it right now, but basically that keeps me in the direction of the trend until I get a little bit of a bull flag. You can see volume confirmed out of the bull flag, got thicker. This is good volume. This is the same chart on a 30 minute. So you see how volume is just continuing. More volume, more volume. On trend days, you're gonna get big volume, uh, you know, the institutions moving to market. This is just basically uh, the daily just to show you the combination. We're gonna buy here, this is going up. Here's the trend. We're above the 30 high, you gotta buy there, the slope's turning up, all those give me my buy signal. So this is a, a basic look at what I do. This is Linda's 310 oscillator, which I like looking at momentum indicators too. She's got me looking at it. Yeah, 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 you know, so like, I, you know, I, I, if you have sell divergencies or buy divergencies, here you've got a, um, you know, uh, a nice uptrend. You know, we're making higher highs pretty much. So this is a continuation on momentum. So what I love about is, your work yeah. is you are layering confirmation. It's confirmation after confirmation after it's confirmation. True. And you're just doing, it seems to me, more of what really works for you and almost eliminating what doesn't work. So if you don't have confirmation, it's like you're not trading. Exactly, exactly. So this is uh, just a, a quick little uh, snapshot. All right. And then Last there's slide. one one other thing. So I I like market profile, and you know that. And I, yeah. And I do put that on Twitter every day. Just uh, this market profile uh, that it works with Photon Trader, Window Trader is nice because I was able to break out the actual segments, the time zones, as you notice here. You see this big. We came out of this little consolidation, two three day co consolidation. The market broke out, rebalanced up here. This is the U.S. day session. This is how Asia traded, and then Europe took it to a new high. And as you know, we're higher than this. This is, you know, contract heads. Yeah. So levels are very important. And so I look at these areas as key decision areas of when I get there, how, how's the market looking? So then I look at volume. So when we got to this high and we had that single print, how did the market trade? Did it fail? Did volume die up? Because, you know, if volume dies up here, what happens? You know, psh, there's no interest. Nobody wants that. You know, down here, they're finding that there's good value here. So it came right back came up. Right off it, yep. So there, and this helps me understand who's got control of the market, basically. You know, this is definitely big institutional uh, market, you know, buying coming in. This isn't the little guy, you know. On the other hand, this is where you get a scalping day, kind of a slippery slope. We go up. We go down, we go up, we go down, and we keep doing this. This is the point of control. So all these things help me, you know, kind of give me confirmation 
of what kind of day it is, who's got control of the market, do we have confirmation on a breakout or not, is volume confirming or isn't it? That's what I learned from the pit and I put to the screen. So this is kind of a basic you know, overview, but I wanted to kind of cover all these little bases. Yeah, no, excellent overview, Damon. Confirmation, yeah. confirmation, confirmation. Yeah. Great right. stuff. Next up, everybody, Pax and I will discuss the qualities of a long-term profitable trader. Stay tuned. Why trade with TradeStation? It's innovative, easy to use, and totally freaking sweet. With powerful tools to track and execute your trades and low per trade commissions on stocks, futures, and options. Upgrade your trade at TradeStation.com. Welcome back, everybody. I'm now joined by Matt Pax Kenna. Pax, thanks for coming in. Thanks, Ant. Long-term profitable traders. There's a fine line between traders who succeed and traders who struggle. You know, we talk a lot about uh, we talk a lot about the paradoxes within trading. We talk a lot about the uncertainty. Every trade that we make has got an uncertain outcome. Every trade we make has an uncertain outcome. Every trade we make also has a theoretical potential to make our wildest financial dreams come true <laughs> and also ruin our financial careers. Too many traders come in here with dreams of grandeur, I think. Too many traders start trading, especially nowadays, without the trading floor, without the way that we came up kind of like through the minor leagues, you know, work every job up, learn the business. Too many traders come in think, hey, I'm going to be the next millionaire. I'm going to be the next Richard Dennis. I'm going to be the next Tudor Jones. I'm going to be the next Pax or the next Deli. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's, it's not that easy. It's the most difficult thing that I've ever done. I wouldn't change a nickel of my I wouldn't change a minute of my career. Not for all the money in the world. Because it's made me who I am now, and I'm quite happy with that. You know? But there's a very fine line between traders who succeed and traders who fail. It's not, not necessarily knowledge. It's not necessarily what you know versus what I know. It's not necessarily having more information, more knowledge. You know, I think that sometimes people can, can study the market and study charts and study different methodologies and different things to think I'm going to remove that uncertainty. I'm going to be able to become a better trader because I have more knowledge and more info. It's really simple. I think it's mostly between what's, in our, what's between our ears. I have to have a plan. If I have a plan and I execute my plan perfectly, I would rather lose money executing my plan perfectly than executing sloppily and make money because I know that I can make the necessary adjustments to my plan in order to make it work. And I know that if I start to get rewarded for bad behavior, I'm going to develop bad habits. And now I'm veering off my plan and too many traders come in trying to, again, make a million dollars in their first five years of trading or their first year of trading without any plan, and so they struggle. They never find their footing. Capital preservation is just a way that I talk about uh, risk management. Capital preservation is at the core of every trade I make. Every morning I get up, when I look at the markets, and I make the necessary adjustments to my targets, the, the, the main goal that I have is not to dip into the beginning balance of my statement. I do not want that to be one penny lower than what it was when I started that day. So the first, and also back, back to when I started on the screens, one really important part of my plan that I had to figure out was I got a little bit tired of watching, watching profit disappear, you know, just evaporate in front of my eyes because I didn't take it soon enough. I also got sick of taking profit too quickly and watching the market go to my targets and I wanted to jump out the window or start chucking screens out the window. And none of that worked. So I had to figure out how to make it work. So I learned how to preserve my capital by, by I call, I, something I kind of came up with just to keep it simple. There are the four pillars of position management. One is to, to minimize my risk. If I sell 34 halves, for example, and the market goes 34 offer, 33 offer, my risk is minimized because if it comes back up, I'm going to take a scratch or I'm going to take a, a loss very close to my entry point. That's my minimized risk. I remove my risk because at four points in the S&P or 20 cents in crude, different points in different markets, I'll take a quarter of my position off. And now I have no risk. I've got a free trade on. So now I've taken profit a little bit quick, four points in the S&P, 10 points in NASDAQ, 20 cents crude, that kind of thing. And I can let the market go to my next target. I can let the algos do the work for me that we used to do in the pit. You know, when, when I was a trader on the, on the floor, I would have to paint the tape. Now, 
I'll let the algos paint the tape. I just sit back, put my feet up, once my trade is paid for, and I've removed my risk, now I have to maximize my capital, or maximize my profit, that's number three. So I do that by just letting the algos do the work and take it to the profit, or take me to my targets. Number four of my four pillars of position management <laughs> is to exploit my, my profit, and that doesn't happen all the time. What I mean by that is I add at certain points. If we're at a very important level in the S&Ps, you know, for example, today we were talking about the 3049 level. We failed there twice now, three times. We come back up there, we get above there, we close above there, we're gonna go much higher. I'll be long when we go up there, then I will probably add. So that's exploiting my profit. That's, that's taking the money that I've already made, adding to my position without adding to my risk profile. So my risk remains the same because I've already taken profit there. I'm just adding above it. If we get back below it, I simply remove the add-ons and I still, am, I still have the same position that I started with. So those, those things are, I think, you know, they're, they're, we can, traders can have a myriad ways, millions of ways to make money. There's so many different things that we can look at. There's so many different studies that, and they all work and they're all, they're, there's, if they all can work, you know, you can make them work for you. But I think that all profitable traders have a few things in common. Everybody has a plan, they stick to it, they make the adjustments to it when they need to. They know how to manage their risk or capital preservation in, 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 in what I say, and really, really important, and we saw this a lot in these last few weeks in the, in the equity markets with these very, very tight ranges. Sometimes the market I, is telling me not to trade. I listen to the market all the time. I, you know, the, the, those little four pillars or, you know, something I call the three, three rules of engagement, you know. These just little things that help keep me straight and focused will tell me when to go big, when to go small, or not at all. Actually, that's a line from you, by the way. <laughs> yeah. I stole it. Yeah. I glommed it from you. That's your line. <laughs> it's, it's a great line. And it's important. Uh, yeah. Uh, you know, a couple of things I want to talk about. One is expectations. New traders come in with high expectations. Hmm. It's a mistake because expectations will set the tone for your happiness in my mind. So what happens is you expect to make money and when you don't, it changes your mood. That's a great point. You know, so what, what I, it was a mistake I made, which ended up why I had anxiety and all these different things as, as opposed to expect to follow a process. And I know it sounds like something everybody says, but when you are fixated more on that, I feel like you can handle the ups and downs a little bit more at the beginning. And another thing, last thing, because we're just about out of time, is you made your strategy systematic, but yet you're still a discretionary trader. So you took all of the things you were doing well and the things you wanted to do, and you put them into a system, mm -hmm. and you use your discretion, your experience mm -hmm. to execute it. And it works. And it works. It does. It and works. I love it. It was yes. great stuff. It's a marathon, Ian. It's a marathon, a marathon it's not, not a, sprint. a sprint. And we learned that from our trading coach, Mickey Hoppin, when we were both coming up. It's a marathon, not a sprint. If, if we break even, if we break even our first year trading, and this is what so many new traders don't understand. It's a huge win. Oh, gosh, you're so far ahead of the game. If you break even your first year, you're so far ahead of the game. Yeah, Pax, this was awesome. All right, thanks, Ian. Thanks, brother. Next up, we will hear from Dan Hodgman with Top Steps Moment of the Week. Stay tuned. Why trade futures with TradeStation? You can trade over 80 products from home, work, or on the go with a powerful, easy to use interface and prices that let you focus on padding your wallet, not emptying it. Upgrade your trade at TradeStation.com. Welcome back, everybody. I'm now joined by Dan Hodgman. Dan, what's Top Steps Moment of the Week? And this one's pretty awesome. Uh, so Julia from Germany, you hear me a lot of times talk about our, a lot of our traders are getting all in, all out at the same time. Today we're going to talk about a little bit different. Started to scale into a trade that started to create profits for her. And so this one's pretty awesome. She started to frame out, looking at the daily chart here in crude oil, started to just box out a range that she had been watching for a couple weeks and keeping that in mind for if I'm in a trade, where am I going to be looking to get out? Am I going to look for these things to break out of here or am I going to try to stay within this range? And so that's the first thing we have. We start to see crude oil creating a little bit of a trend to the upside, as you can see here. And uh, when we get a little bit closer, looking at the 30-minute chart, the crude oil opened up and started to move higher. And it made an attempt at one point. As you can see, we pushed through this resistance line, um, 
she got excited. She loves that to see that the market broke through. The question is, do you want to get in there? Maybe not. You want to see proof of acceptance when you break through some of these support and resistance levels. So the market ended up coming right back down to that resistance point. She decided to go ahead and <clears throat> start to look for an opportunity to be long. So she put one contract on. It started to pay out, added a second, continued to pay out, added that third, and was able to run it all the way up to her target at 54.65, which if we go back to our first slide here, was the top of that range that she's been watching. Okay. And so she was able to lock in some great profits running three contracts, scaling into her trade, and her first stop was that overnight resistance that we saw. She said, you know what, I don't wanna be wrong too much. Once she got in onto her second and third contract, we brought that stop up so that she was locking in some profits and uh, was gonna be at least break even on this trade. So she originally had her stop in this consolidation area from the initial position. Yes. And then you said after that one moved up her way in these two blue circles, when she added, she moved the stop to where? She brought her stop up to her first entry point and then kind of trailed that stop all the way up, wanting to lock in these profits, always knowing that her target was going to be that top of that channel she'd been watching for a few weeks. What really sticks out to me in, in this trade is patience. Good homework, but really had to wait it out. And didn't jump in initially, waited for the retest, waited for that bar to close and start going up. Then she got in. At that point, because I've been in those positions where you're right. like, man, the market is reacting the way I wanted it to. Boom, boom, boom. That's when you feel like, we call it pressing. You could press it. Absolutely. And I think that I was so proud and excited to see that patience. And that's why I think watching her add that second and third contract. Instead of thinking, are we adding too much? Are we getting too heavy? No, she really waited this one out and was able to make an awesome trade. Yeah, everybody, you know, I always talk about patience, right? And one of my pet peeves when I talk about it is if you don't know what you're looking for, you really can't be patient. But if you know what you're looking for and you finally get it and it gives you what you want, then you can press. Absolutely. So, I think some great lessons in execution. Obviously, patience. I think that's something we've reiterated time and time again. Um, but first off, she defined a range, knew where she was going to get out, wasn't being greedy on that trade. Um, if trading was, if you're going to trade with size, wait for that confirmation. She got that confirmation, was able to scale under this trade, was starting to get paid out really nicely. And uh, when that momentum slowed down, there was no hesitation to let that target get hit. Instead of Continuing to move that target up, she got out and uh, she quit while she was ahead. I love that she got feedback from the market and then pressed. This, I love this it. is a great one. Thanks so much, Dan. Absolutely. Next up, everybody, Danny Sitlow will tell us what's on her radar using Wasable. Stay tuned. This is my headquarters. This is where I trade and manage my portfolio. Since I added futures, I have access to the oil markets and gold markets. Okay. I'm plugged into equities, trade confirmed. And I have global access 24 seven, meaning I can do what I need to do. Then I can focus on what I wanna do. Visit your online broker today to learn more. Welcome back everybody. I'm now joined by Danny Sitlow. Danny, what's on your radar? Hi, Ann. So today I brought up a momentum strategy in NASDAQ. I was actually in this trade. Uh, you know I trade the ORB, so the opening range breakout, um, in within the first 30 seconds of the open, of the central 830 open, right? So here this outlook is a five-hour outlook. The NASDAQ trades above the 20-day moving average. It's a 68% probability it will continue to go up. I was long at the top of the opening range. When I, this alert came in, it came in about 20 minutes after the open. I always point to my wrist because yeah. it, it comes in through my watch, you know? <laughs> and so I'm interested once I'm in a market and I get an alert that it's the market that I'm trading, I need to pull it up. It's additional information for me. I'm pretty comfortable where I'm at because I lean on my method. But I also want to know, do I need to add to this method to what I'm trading? Is it something where I want to bring in more risk or is it something that I want to take off risk? Or is it something that I need to just get out and sit back, right? Because that's the other option to do nothing, although I was in this trade. So I'll give you the update. 
In this update, which I find is really the most interesting, is I'm in it, a 60% chance it'll go higher. It actually hit the target. I didn't add on because I'm still watching the alerts and getting used to myself back in trading. And what it did was it hit the alert and at the upside, and then it came down on the downside. So super interesting to me as I'm watching it and I'm long from even, it hits 22. Okay, so I'm wondering, do I need to scratch out of this trade or should I hold it a little bit longer? Well, the best part about this alert is there's actually a one day outlook, so a longer term alert. So it helps me also decide, okay, I know I'm out at a scratch, but what's the longer term? Will it actually, is it gonna hit 22 and go lower and I need to scratch out or is it gonna hit 22 and come back up, right? It's watching numbers, watching targets and the longer term outlook helps me either hold on to the trade or get out. And so here on a one day outlook, while the probability is 57 upside, 43 downside, it's even, even to me, but I'm still looking at those targets right here, right? The upside target, the downside target. So I'm aware as to where the market's going and what numbers to watch. So if I hold on, I know where it's going. If I want to take it off, I feel good about taking it off. I've taken my profit because the ORB method, I've already paid for my trade, the upside targets. It's just now I'm using the alerts to add on risk or take it off or not do anything at all. Danny, I have to compliment you. One of the things I talk a lot about, market awareness. Know what's going on around you. Because a lot of times when people get into a trade, they just become so focused on just you know the, the market action as opposed to looking at an alert. Okay, there's higher probabilities on your, uh, to go up that yeah. maybe relaxes you in the trade. Like you said, gives you options. Do I want to add to this? Do I want to cover it? And I really loved how you used a shorter term outlook and then when you got the alert for the longer term outlook, how you layered them and then you made your decision from there. It's yeah. really good work. Yeah, and in addition to that, it's, you know, we have the stories on the right hand side and a day later, the NASDAQ trades 2% higher than the previous day close. So it gives me even a better picture of these alerts. Because remember these alerts come out because it's 10 years of consistency when these markets hit these markers. So it's a 20 day moving average that the NASDAQ crosses above. Interesting, what's the behavior? Upside momentum. All right, I got it. And now maybe I hold on. Maybe I'm okay with taking a little bit of downside if my upside, you know, if my reward is way greater than my risk, maybe I'll sit with it a little bit longer. Yeah, I love it. One other thing I want to comment on, instead of staring at the book, like I said, when people are getting focused, talking about market awareness, seeing the bigger picture, right? Yeah. Just absorbing it, what's happening around me. Great, yeah. great stuff, Danny. All right, everybody, next up and beyond the charts, Sarah Gaines will discuss energy work for high stress environments. Stay tuned. Hey, everybody, thanks for tuning into the show. To learn more about the charts I use, Wasable Alerts, the basics of trading futures, and how you can even get funded to trade futures, please visit anthonycrudelli.com. Now, let me take you right back to trading futures. Welcome back, everybody. Pax and Damon are still with us, and we are now joined by intuitive energy worker and feng shui consultant at Red Bird Reiki, Sarah Gaines. Sarah, thank you so much for joining thank us. Thank you so much for having me. Sarah, talk to us about some of the energy work that you do. Absolutely. So energy work in general, it helps us rebalance and restore our body. Um, the modality that I practice is called Reiki. It's like one of the most common forms of energy work. Uh, it originates from Japan and it stands for universal life force energy. And so what I'm doing in a session is I'm working with um, what you may call like prana or chi, or we just call energy here in the West. And what I'm doing is I'm looking for blockages in the body and really helping us to just restore and reground, especially in our fast paced, modern, stressful lives. Yeah, I, I receive Reiki every week, actually. Have either of you guys? No, I have not, but I'm open to yeah, it. Yeah, I'm open to that. <laughs> Explain to them a little bit more mm -hmm. what, what goes into it. Yeah, absolutely. So in a one-on-one -on -one session, um, it can be hands-on or just slightly above the body. And the way I work is very intuitive, so I'm looking to see where are we holding stress and tension in the body. A lot of times in our modern world, we're carrying a lot in our shoulders, like our neck. Obviously, we're really mental. Um, you know, we're not really outside working with our hands as much as we used to back in the day. So I'm really working um, on all the planes as well. I'm working on the physical body, mental body, and emotional bodies. So you're not just feeling physically better, but you're also emotionally feeling less stress, um, usually sleeping 
a lot more, yeah. um, decreased anxiety, helping with focus at work? Well, for me, most everybody knows I had a heart attack at 36 years old, and a lot of my stress was in my chest. So when I started to receive Reiki, they would be like, we're feeling a lot of stress here. So it actually helped me identify where I was, the stress was sitting, mm -hmm. and it helped me release it. Mm -hmm. uh, so I highly recommend it to anybody. It's, it's really great. Mm -hmm. uh, talk to us about feng shui. Yeah, so I think of feng shui as being like energy work, but for your home. So I love to say that like our energy, I'm sorry, our homes are like a reflection of us. So um, if we are feeling stressed, um, if we're feeling anxiety, that usually reflects in our home. So if we're not really feeling like getting one-on-one -on -one energy work with our bodies, we can actually manipulate and change the energy in our home to make us feel better. We've all heard <laughs> those terms, right? Um, feng shui. Mm -hmm. When you go into a home, to make it feng shui, I mean, mm -hmm. I, I, I've not had this done. Mm -hmm. Talk to us about that process. Yeah, so what I do is I walk into a home and first I always ask the client, you know, how are you feeling in your space, right? Um, I always like to do this practice where I say, um, you know, describe your home, like my home feels, right? And people say, okay, my home feels messy, disorganized, um, or they might say joyful or light. Um, but then I say, replace my home with your name. And then they go, oh, right? Um, so they're like, oh, I'm feeling a little disorganized, right? I'm feeling stressed. And it's like, okay. So I walk into a home and I'm looking at where are those qualities showing up within the home, um, especially if you're working from home a lot, like we are, most of us do these days, or a lot of us do these days, I should say. Um, I always like to go straight into someone's office um, because if you're working from home, you're spending most of your day probably in your office, right? Um, so I always look to see, okay, how are things placed in the office? Um, a biggest mistake is a lot of people will shove or cram their desk into a corner and they'll work against the wall, right? And what that energetically does is it makes us feel a little bit small or weak. Uh, mm. So if you think about the sort of classic setup, like in a movie where you walk into like a big boss's office, how is that set up? It's in the middle of the room, they have a strong wall behind them, they can see the door, no one can sneak up behind them, and they can see the window, right? So the first thing I do is I go and I take your desk and I move it out into the, more into the middle of the room, give you what's called the command position. And that actually will energetically change how you feel when you're working. Like you're more confident, um, you just feel so much stronger, and you actually feel less vulnerable as you're working throughout the day. I like to bring in natural elements like stones, plants, things like that. Um, if you can get like a dimmer switch on your lights because we're just being blasted with the light from like laptops and computer screens. So all these little things and little tweaks we can make to our space just really just increases our energy and allows us to like work better, have more focus. What do you guys think? It sounds like something a trader should have done. Hey, hey. Oh, most definitely. Talking about stress, I mean, yeah. my stress is <laughs> everywhere. So before we let you go, these guys are interested in getting Reiki. I'm mm -hmm. sure a lot of the people listening are as well. Yeah. What do you recommend to them, those first steps, searching for someone so they can receive Reiki? What should they be looking for in a Absolutely. Reiki person? Yeah, well, firstly, find someone you trust, reach out to them, you know, do some research. Um, if you're not quite sure about getting Reiki specifically, you know, there's lots of modalities like acupuncture that also involve energy work. Uh, but doing the research and really like asking some questions, reading through their website, their bio, seeing how long they've been doing energy work. Because um, it's really important to um, find someone that you really trust because it can work at the mental and emotional levels and it can be a little bit vulnerable the first time you get a Reiki session. Um, so finding someone you trust is really important. I agree with you. That was the top thing on my list. I found someone I trusted and it's really, it's, it's changed my life, honestly. Uh, for those in the Chicagoland mm -hmm. area that maybe want to come visit you, talk to us about Redbird and where people can learn more about you. Yeah, absolutely. So I have a studio where I do one-on-one -on -one Reiki sessions uh, that's located in Wicker Park. Um, but you can also find me online at redbirdreiki.com or Instagram at redbirdreiki. Um, I also do remote sessions, um, especially for feng shui. Sarah, this was great. Thank you so much. Dam Damon and Pax, you guys are the best. Hey, everybody, thanks for tuning in today. You can catch all of the episodes on anthonycaridelli.com and you can follow me on Twitter and Instagram. See you next time. Right in the middle.